honor to worship with you today. And a special welcome to any guests or visitors we have, and anybody watching online through Facebook, leave a like, leave a comment, let us know you're here with us. Uh, share the video too, let your friends know uh, about God's word. Our focus for worship today is how a simple invitation God uses to call people to faith in him. And we begin with our first hymn, God Bless Our Worship. our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions, I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, who gave your one and only Son to be the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and believed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading appointed for use in Christian churches on this Sunday comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. A young boy named Samuel receives an extraordinary call from God. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. 
In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. So Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that it was the Lord calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord. And you know me. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Today's second reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul explains here that the, the way God calls us today is through the gospel, the, the message about Jesus Christ. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with two verses of our next hymn.
honor the words and the words of Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. The gospel reading for today comes from John chapter 1. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. If we were in heaven right now, and we were to ask the souls up there how they first got to meet Jesus for the first time, what do you think they would say? Would they say it was at their baptism? Or would they say that they were walking past a Christian church one day and just decided to walk in? Maybe some of them encountered the message of Jesus online. Or more likely, I think, they would say that a friend or a family member invited them. In our scripture for meditation today, we see examples of that last one. We see how a friend's invitation plays a pivotal role in how people, how many people enter into the kingdom of heaven. And a simple invitation is effective because when we invite someone to come meet Jesus on earth, 
extraordinary God, that invitation then becomes extraordinary. Today's Gospel reading started out with an invitation from Jesus himself. John tells us that the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus met this guy named Philip and invited him to be a Christian. And a Christian is just a, a follower of Christ. So he said, follow me. Jesus said those words a lot to many different people. But the thing is, really everything Jesus did while he was on this earth was an invitation. Right? Every miracle he performed, every bit of God's wisdom he shared with people, every person he forgave, that was an invitation for people to believe in him as the Son of God, as, as the only Savior from sin. So Jesus invited Philip, and Philip followed him. But why was his invitation so effective? Because Philip followed him immediately. And usually when you and I meet somebody for the first time, we don't just immediately follow them and believe everything they say just because they ask us to. What was going on here? Well, John tells us, he says that Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Ah, so Andrew and Peter had become followers of Jesus the day before, and they were from the same town as Philip. So probably they had told Philip all about Jesus and invited him to follow him as well. Here we come to the first major takeaway for our meditation today. And it's, it's a truth that is pretty obvious, and it's one that we probably already know. It's just good to remember for the sake of its importance in bringing people into the kingdom of heaven. And it's this, that when, when an invite comes from somebody you know and respect, that's powerful, as it was for Philip. He was so excited about finding Jesus that, you know, it was his first day as a disciple, and he's already inviting his friends to follow Jesus too, which is what he did. He found his friend Nathaniel and told him, hey, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip gave Nathaniel this rock-solid testimony about who Jesus is, that the promised Messiah, the, the one the Old Testament scriptures had prophesied about, he's here, I, I just met him, he's this man named Jesus. Can we give testimony about Jesus like, like Philip did? I think we often wish we could do that, right? But, but we get nervous about what to say. You know, we wonder, can, can we say it as clearly as Nathaniel did? And then we, we worry about how people might react, right, if we bring up Jesus or religion. What if people doubt or criticize our beliefs? That's, what, that's actually what happened to Philip here. Because Nathaniel asked him, Master, can anything good come from there? So basically, Nathaniel's like, you're saying, you're telling me that the Savior of the world is coming from Nazareth? I know Nazareth. I don't think anything good comes from there. So Philip responds to this, and he actually has the perfect answer. And it's one that we could use if we're in a similar situation. Philip said, come and see. Just come and see. And that's a, that's a masterful invitation because it, it works in an extraordinary way. It doesn't get you into an argument. It doesn't require you to have all the right answers and know all the right things to say. It's just come and see. It builds expectation. It's like, it's like saying, come on, give it a try. You know, see, just come and, and test out and see if what I'm telling you really is the truth. And if somebody accepts one of our invitations like that, and they actually come and hear or see 
or read about Jesus, you know, what happens then? How are they going to react to the story and the message of Jesus? Well, at that point, it's in God's hands. But we do have this confidence that because our invitations bring people to the word about Jesus, then that gives Jesus the opportunity to invite them himself. And see, he always knows the right thing to say, and his invitations are extraordinarily powerful because his words are full of love. Nathaniel got to see that power and that love when he came to meet Jesus. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. You know, at first glance, it's, it's really an odd thing to say. And you're right, it, it is an odd thing to say because Jesus judged Nathaniel's character here. And he said Nathaniel was a sincere man. Yeah, he had his doubts, but he was searching for the truth. It was the type of judgment call you could only make if you knew the man personally. But that's just the thing. Jesus and Nathaniel had never met. So, this is really an odd thing for any ordinary human being to say. That's why Nathaniel asked, How do you know me? And then Jesus revealed that he wasn't just any normal human being, he's all powerful God, too. Because he answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Jesus saw him. And it wasn't like earlier in the day Jesus saw Nathaniel off in the distance under a tree. No, Jesus saw him through and through his life, his heart, his doubts, everything about him because he's God, he is all known. And then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, which means teacher, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. He was a believer now. He had come to Jesus because someone he knew had invited him. But he stayed with Jesus because Jesus truly knew him and still loved him. So Jesus truly knows us too. He knows everything we've done, even the things we, we did when no one else was watching. He knows the darkest parts of our hearts and lives, and he still invites us to follow him. And, and it's not that he overlooks the bad or just accepts us for who we are. No, he forgives us. And he wants us to be with him because he loves us. Isn't that an amazing thing? I mean, think about that for a second. We've all got that that nagging feeling that the people who love us and care about us, if they actually knew the real me and the things that I've done and my darkest secrets, if they actually knew that, they wouldn't love me as much as they do. If at all. But that's not, that's not the way it is with Jesus. He knows it all, still loves you, and is not ashamed to be with you. God himself, through Jesus, invites us to be with him, to follow him. Once Nathaniel believed, Jesus told him, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, but you will see greater things than that. And then he said, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending onto the Son of Man. Basically, Jesus is saying that you came to see me good. You're amazed that I know you and still love you? Great, I do. But you ain't seen nothing yet. Just wait. Follow me, and you're going to see heaven open and the way into it. I am that way. See, Jesus' invitation is so extraordinary because not only because of his power and his love, 
He builds expectation for even better things to come. For you and me and everyone who follows Jesus, we will see greater things. And if not in this life, then when heaven is open to us. So what does this all mean? You know, when we go home, when we go about our, our regular work weeks, what does this mean for our lives? Well, it means that God takes something as simple as one of our invitations to meet Jesus, and he makes it extraordinary. Right? A simple invitation opens heaven for people. Today, God asks us to remember and appreciate how, how God first invited us to be with him. But he also asks us to consider how we might invite more people to meet his son. Right? The only way to the kingdom of heaven. And we all have family and friends who don't know Jesus yet. So invite them. You invite them to come to church and then offer to, to sit with them. And I know you might have to sit near them because we've got to socially distance now, but, but offer all the same. You know, offer to introduce them to people. Show them around. Or if you're you know, watching online at home, invite people to watch with you online. You know, share the worship live stream or start a watch party on Facebook. There's so many ways to do this. And you know, we don't need to worry about which Sunday we invite people. Like if we were waiting for just the right day, because Jesus is preached here every Sunday. No matter what word of God we're focusing on, Jesus inspires repentance and belief and awe. Another thing that you could do is you know invite people to study the Bible. You just just read it with them, explain it to them, and show people the hope that Jesus gives you. And if you're a little uncomfortable with that, you know, invite people to come to the Bible studies we offer here at church. We have a couple of them right now. And offer to, to sit with them and learn with them as we go through it. Give people a chance to meet God who knows them and loves them too. God be with us as we do that. Amen. Peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, it's normally the time we pass around the offering basket, but for now we're going to keep that on the, on the table in the entryway. And if you're worshiping with us online, you can still give your offering through e-transfer, and the instructions for that are on our website. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, who called us into fellowship of your Son, Jesus Christ, who opens up heaven for us, thank you. And we send your Spirit to help us freely speak about Jesus to all the world. Today, we particularly come before you on behalf of our brother, Johnson Toot, who just this morning found out that his, his wallet and other um, identifying documents were stolen out of his car last night. Uh, be with him and help him recover from this. 
and please guard him and his life and his possessions that no one no one steal any more from him. And we also come before you today on behalf of, of all nations and their leaders, especially those of Canada and the provincial government here and the United States. To give them strength, to uphold their responsibilities, and to use their authority well. Please also bless all the rest of our nation's public servants, our armed forces, police, and first responders. We ask this according to your will, and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We finish with our closing hymn and please be seated.
you so much again for coming and worshiping with us today. And again, a special welcome to those with us online. Just got a few announcements for us today. Again, about the uh, about e-transfer, we just recently set that up, and the instructions for that are on the screen and also on our website with the give the give tab. Next Sunday, we have worship communion and Bible study, and uh, this is a big one. So the last Sunday of the month, January 31st, we have a congregational meeting. So that will that will take place uh, immediately after the worship service in place of Bible study. So please. Uh, Put that in your calendars. Um, please uh, schedule time for that. Uh, so we'll, we'll just briefly, I will give a report of my pastoral duties in the past six months, and, and our president, Mr. Byron Wyman, will give a report of uh, our church's, I believe, uh, financials and um, the other matters. And then there'll be a, a voters meeting immediately after that congregation meeting. We should be able to wrap all that up in, I would say, 40, 45 minutes. So thank you for your attendance at that. And we'll be doing it by Zoom, so we can have a little interaction as well. So mm -hmm. we'll, uh, we'll send that link out once uh, once we get it set up, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that reminder, Byron. So yeah, so everyone obviously who's here at church will be here for it in person. But those worshiping online will be able to join and also comment and ask questions and give input uh, through Zoom. So we'll put the Zoom up on the screen so uh, they can participate in this as well. Thanks for everyone who made this, this service today happen, our, our musician Laura and, uh, and Joey Purcell over there on our camera. Thanks for operating those, and I thank Rebecca Yap and her two sons who are here cleaning everything uh, so we can be safe today. Next week's cleaners are the, the Laking family. Whoever's got the clicker, could you bring it up here please? Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, so we have a we have our 19 minute Bible study now. I'm setting my timer on my phone. This Bible study is uh, it's also what our confirmation students, our seventh and eighth graders, are going through, and um, we have a, the adult version of it uh, here on Sunday right after church. Set my timer here. It will be 19 minutes, and we're going to continue our study of of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. So if you remember, just about, oh yes, fire. Oh, the mic is in the other room. So oh, it's already there. Yeah, I'll be asking yeah, questions. I will be asking questions during Bible study and so the people in the other room can comment through the microphone over there. So we're going to the first article of the Apostles' Creed. We, we actually spoke the Apostles' Creed out loud just about seven minutes ago in the worship service. It's a, a 1,700-year-old uh, statement of Christian faith. And, and the first article is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now our, our old pastor, Dr. Martin Luther, um, gave us this handy summary of what this means. So when we speak this in church, this is what we're actually saying. It means this, I believe that God created me and all that exists, and he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. So we're talking about how God created everything. Last week we talked about how God created this world in six days, and everything was perfect at first. Uh, but obviously things aren't that way anymore. How did, we, how did this perfect creation of God get ruined? The answer to that is, is the devil. So that's why um, on the screen here, I got some passages the Bible tells us about the devil, so we gotta get a better idea of who he is and, and why he ruined everything. So I'm gonna split the room up here and uh, I'll assign a different passage to different people. So let's do, how about this group over here take that first passage. What do we know about the devil from that first passage, 2 Peter 2? Uh, this section over here, take that second passage, Jude 6, and then uh, the people in the Bible study room over there with the microphone, you guys got the last one. What do we learn about the devil from these passages? I'll give you about 20 seconds to just look at them and see if you can come up with an answer. I'll come back to you.
I know we all got masks on, but it is, it is okay to speak to those members of your family sitting next to you and discuss this. It's been about 20 seconds. How about the, how about the first passage? I'll read it for us all. So, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. What do we what do we learn about the devil from from that? What do you think, Kira? You're our confirmation student over here in this group. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the devil uh, is an angel. An angel who sinned and, um, and then became a demon. He's a fallen angel. Um, and so God did not spare uh, the angels when they sinned, but he, but he punished them. Yeah, he judged it. Mm -hmm. And then what else? Is there anything else we learned about the devil here? How about where he was sent to? Yeah, he was sent to hell. So the punishment for the devil is, is hell. Mm -hmm. His angels disobeyed him, and uh, he received judgment for that. How about the, the second passage here? I'll read it for us all. The angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains or judgment. Anything we want to add to what we know about the devil from this Bible passage? The devil was cunning enough to deceive angels to get to let them give up what they knew in heaven. Mm -hmm. If he's that strong, surely he's more strong than we are, and we can't resist him either. Yeah, that, that's really that you bring up a practical. Uh, truth as well. So, yes, yeah, so the devil, it seems like he had he held a position of authority among the angels, and he fell away and seemed to convince some of the other angels to fall away and disobey God with him. So there we have, we have a rebellion in heaven amongst the angels and against God. Um, so yeah, he led that rebellion. So if he, if the devil uh, was able to convince angels to disobey God, then uh, we should be wary of him uh, lest he deceive you and me. Excellent point, Robert. And uh, the last passage, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How about the, the room over there? Whoever's got the mic, want to give an answer? The devil is looking for someone to like um, deceive and make them, and make them his like, agent or something. Yeah, I, I recognize that voice. Thank you for that answer, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, so jo uh, the devil wants to deceive us and maybe even make people his agents so that um, he wants to make people agents of evil as well, just like he is. Um, he's bent on, on destroying us. Um, yeah, he, so God, uh, the devil hates God and he hates everything that God loves, which means he hates you and me. And he wants to drag you and me down to hell with him so that we suffer the same punishment he does. Um, that, is, that is a scary thing. The devil is an angel, and he, and he is after all of us. Thankfully, God didn't just leave this world in a mess. Um, he did something to, to help us. Now, um, we want to get into briefly here, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to review the events of of Genesis chapter 3. So, so think about this uh, timeline in your head. So God created everything. Everything was perfect. Some of his angels disobeyed and all of a sudden not everything was perfect. Right? Some angels rebelled. Now Satan took the form of a serpent um, and then appeared to the first people, Adam and Eve, and tempted them to sin and also disobey God with him. Adam and Eve did not have to fall into temptation. They did not have to, uh, to listen to the devil. But they did. They freely chose to sin and disobey God. And that's why, that's why we are uh, the way we are today. Um, the devil tempted people to sin. People sinned. And now sin is everywhere. 
and it, it infects everything and all people. Now, I'm going to read this section here, and as I read, I want you to see if you can come up with at least three things, three consequences of humanity's fall into sin. So the devil received his own consequences. What are, what are the consequences for us in this earth? So, um, after Adam and Eve sinned, he said to the woman, Eve, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. What are some consequences for us in this world that you see here? I want to give the other room a chance at the first, first answer here. Does anybody have a thought over there? One consequence that I see is that um, like when, you want, when someone wants to eat, they have to put in a lot of work to eat because the ground is like hard to, to, to eat. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be hard to feed yourself and your family. It's going to take hard work. That's one. Can we come up with two more? Another one is uh, the woman has to go through pain because of the bed. Yeah, painful childbirth. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And uh, give me the third, maybe from this room. Yeah, that, that's a... It, that's an interesting way to say it, right? The husband would rule over the wife, um, and her, her desire would be for him. Um, that's talking about, yeah, so when mankind sinned, not only did they break their relationship with God, but they also ruined relationships with other people. So immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, their marriage also suffered. Um, they now have, um, they were at, at odds with each other, and in fact, they were blaming each other. For what happened. Um, so yeah, the strife um, in, in uh, relationships between men and women is, is a big consequence of this. Sin, sin ruins relationships. It just does. And uh, this is how it continues to go on. See if you can find two more consequences here. Uh, God said you, the ground will provide thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. I'll start with this room first. What, you, what are some more consequences you see here? Death. Yep. Uh, we are dust, and to dust we will return. We were not, God did not create people to die. They were meant, meant to live with him in perfect relationship forever. Uh, death was never a part of God's plan. Um, and I guess uh, Jonathan's answer kind of steals this one too. Um, sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Right? It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to make a living. Because the ground, in fact, that's probably what we want to add from this. That the ground is cursed. Right? The very earth itself is, is dying and decaying. And the ground is going to show that. It's not going to be easy to, to work it, uh, to, get, to get food. And here's maybe the, the last major consequence of the fall, and the ruin of God's creation. Uh, just two chapters later, after Genesis 3, Genesis 5 says this, And when God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. Now this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff, right? Um, and he named them mankind when they were created. Now, what happens here? When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. What, what is the consequence here? Something changes over the course of those few verses that I read. Yeah, yeah. So originally, 
when, when everything was perfect, human beings were, were in the image of God. They were, they were perfect. Um, but once humans sinned, they lost the image of God. And so when, when Adam and Eve had their first children, their children no longer were born with the image of God, but they were born in the image of man, in the image of sinful Adam, their sinful father. So if we were to just compare the image of God, which human beings were originally created in and for, to the image of man, which we are in today, um, how would we do that? Let's, well, how about A and B? Uh, this room takes A and B, and the room in the fellowship hall, right? You guys take options C and D. See if you can come up with what the image of man would be for, for those. I'll give you about 10 seconds here. think about that, that letter A. If image of God is sinless and holy, what is image of man? You could just go opposites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sinful and unholy. Right? How about B? If, if Adam and Eve originally had free will, they were able not to sin. They, they were able to remain perfect. What are we today? We're born sinful. From birth, right in the womb, we are already sinful. Yeah, the, the scriptures say that even from conception, we are sinful. We're, we're literally, we, we're brought into this world from the very get go, um, sinful. Um, and because of that, we are, we are captive to sin. We are unable to keep from sin. Have you ever, have you ever tried to stop? Doing something wrong, or to, or to just like be perfect, it's impossible. We are completely unable to stop sinning while on this earth. Um, so, and that's what that means is our we don't actually have free will. If we actually had free will, we would be able to stop sinning if we wanted to, but we are not able to do that. Therefore, our will is is captive to sin. Um, C, perfect fellowship with God. How about that, that other room? What do you got? One second. There are gods and gods, and we have been trying to assign to one of God's gods. Yeah, so we no longer a perfect relationship with God. We were at odds with God. We were, you know, his enemies. And then the if if uh, image of God is perfect knowledge of God's will, then well, I think the like perfect knowledge of God's will for like humans and that would be right. So more likely get an imperfect knowledge of God's will. We don't know, we don't fully understand God or his word now, even though human beings were meant to. We were meant to be fully united with God and his will. We got just a couple more minutes, so I want to skip to um, some brief application. Skip back. How does, um, so what Robert Brander just said a, a few moments ago that we were conceived and even born in sin, uh, that's a doctrine we call, we call it original sin. That we, we come into this world sinful, inheriting sin from our parents. Because our parents were sinful, they beget sinful children. Right? So how does, how does knowing that we're, we come into this world with original sin, how does that help parents raise their children? What do you think? I wonder if you can come up with three ways. Yeah, we can't expect our kids to naturally know the right thing. We have to teach them what is right, or else 
They won't know. Yeah. Do you have one, Joanne? Yeah, you still have to um, understand that and to forgive them and to love them. Yeah. So yeah, so it basically means that we should not be surprised when our kids fail and disappoint us. Right? We, but we are to be patient with them, forgiving them, uh, just like our God has forgiven us. Right? We, must, we must teach them what is right and also teach them the forgiveness that they have through Jesus. Yeah, it's, it's crucial that we, we teach our kids that. I think uh, I will also add to the obedience to the kids of God. We teach obedience. Okay. Obedience. Yeah, we must teach that it Our is good. Our kids will be obedient to the kids of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we must teach obedience. The, the children must be obedient be to God and their, and their parents. Also be patient too. And patience, yeah. Because it takes time. Yeah, kids, kids are not a blank slate. Right? They, they come into this world sinful. And it's everything we parents can do to, to, to help drive that sin out. And, and teach them what is godly and what is right. Yeah, it takes it takes time, it takes patience. A little summary, and uh, lastly, here I'm gonna we're, we're pretty much done here. So I'm gonna close with uh, the first promise of the Savior. So that very first day when when the devil came and tempted Adam and Eve, and, and humanity fell into sin, and creation was ruined, uh, God did not go one day without uh, promising a way to fix it. So uh, after those, those curses, right, after God was explaining the consequences of their actions, uh, he told, he told uh, this to, to Satan. He said, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So what this is talking about is that one of the women, one of the, one of Eve's offspring, one of her descendants, would crush the devil's head. Now, uh, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, this this promise um, becomes clearer and clearer. We start to learn about who this descendant would be and how he would come. Right? There were prophecies that would tell us that he would come from a virgin woman. Um, Prophecies that would tell us he would come from the town of Bethlehem. And eventually he came, and that, that is Jesus. And by him dying on the cross and paying the punishment for, for everyone's sin, by doing that, he defeated the devil and, in a symbolic sense, you know, crushed the devil's head. Let's close with prayer. Father, you have sinned. We are not worthy of any of your blessings. Forgive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus our Savior. Day by day, by the working of your Spirit, renew in us the image, your image, the glory of your name. Amen. Hey, Pastor. Yeah. Over on this side, we've got a, a, a young lady that is celebrating a birthday today. And we're wondering if we can sing Jody a happy birthday. Absolutely. Let me put on my mask. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jody. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, happy birthday. God bless you, too. Thanks for uh, bringing that to my attention, Brian. And, uh, and just, just yeah, quick. There's a special, like, second verse. Oh, there's a special second verse? How does that go? <laughs> All right. Yeah, thanks once again for coming today. Uh, God bless the rest of your week. And uh, quick reminder: as we as we um, leave our seats, please respect our, our government's 
uh, guidelines and restrictions by uh, keeping that, that distance and keeping your mask on. Thank you so much. God bless you.